This is a game against a very talented and dangerous rival of mine named Michael Gran. For some reason, whenever Michael and I played, he had the white pieces and attacked me right off the bat. He had an incredibly fierce and sophisticated opening repertoire, and so I often came out of the opening in a bit of trouble. It's easy to get dispirited in this type of situation. You sit down and are hurting right off the bat. You've already seen me in this kind of situation against Dave Arnett and against Jeff Sauer. When this happens, you have to stay cool, think on your feet, work your way out of the jam one step at a time. Michael and I were in the National Junior High School Championships. I actually show this position in my first book, Attacking Chess. Once again, I'm on the ropes. Michael seems to have a huge advantage, but I made a deep calculation and found a way out. Okay, here my position is bad, borderline desperate. What can I do? White has a deeply advanced e-pawn, which is like a bone in my throat. His queen on e5 is in a great position. My bishop on f5 is pinned. It can't move because my queen will come under attack. His knight on c5 is in a fantastic outpost, and he's looking to jump into the d7 square. His rook on f1 is piled up on the bishop on f5, which is barely defended enough by my rook on f8 and queen on g5. I can't move my rook on e7 because his e6 pawn will advance. My position is teetering, just on the edge. Basically, for a few moves now, I've based my defense around the idea of playing rook f6. Calculate. Let me know what you think. Once again, think about the psychology of the situation. We're in a critical round of a national championship face-off, and I'm on the ropes. My opponent thinks he has me. His coach was running around the playing hall, pumping his fists. I have to see one move deeper. Can I play rook f6? Take your time, and tell me what you think. As you can probably guess, I decided yes. Rook f6. This had been my intention for some time now. I did a deep calculation. Rook f6 and he played knight d7. In this type of situation, for example in this position here, we have to have a calm, steady state of mind. Think deeply. Calculate. Look at what your opponent has in mind. Figure out the variations that he's counting on. And often it'll be a quiet move in the middle of the craziness that'll be the opportunity. He's attacking my rook on f6. If I move, for example, to g6, what does he do? Should white play rook takes f5? No, this would be a big mistake, because now the g2 score is threatened. Queen takes g2 checkmate. The first question you ask yourself every time someone makes a move is why did he do that? What is his threat? After rook g6, white should play a quiet move. Rook e2. Now the bishop on f5 is under attack, and if it moves, for example, bishop e4, now what should white play? Exactly. Good job. Rook f8 is checkmate. The knight on d7 guards the rook. The king can't move anywhere. It's all over. After knight d7, my whole calculation a few moves ago was based on playing the move rook f takes e6. So now take some time. What does white do here? After rook f takes e6, it may look good for me initially. Because, for example, if I go back, queen c3, black can play rook takes e1, rook takes e1, and now you have the very strong move bishop to h3. A fantastic attacking move. Now, you're threatening checkmate over here. So if rook takes e7, do you see what black would play? Exactly. Queen takes g2, checkmate. After queen takes h3, what should black play here? Exactly. Rook takes e1, and we win. If white plays g3 here, then what should we do? No, that's not the best move. Here we can just trade rooks and take on d7. Why don't you take a moment here for white and try to find the key move that my opponent had in mind. We know that moving the queen away is no good. Black will be winning. The knight on d7 will hang.
I know that moves a blunder. Here, black can play queen takes f5. And after rook takes f5, we've removed the defender of the rook. Rook takes e1, and black is winning the game. Exactly. Excellent job. This is a very strong attacking move, which my opponent's whole plan was based on. Rook takes f5, threatens my queen, and if I take his queen, you see what he should do? Exactly. Rook f8. A back rank mate. The knight on d7 guards the f8 square, and white wins the game. This is the tactic that he had in mind. But of course, I saw that. So we see that we can't take on e5 because of rook f8. Checkmate. Do you see my idea here? Queen takes f5. Excellent. That's the move I had in mind. He played queen takes f5. And now rook takes e1 check. King f2. It's not over yet. In this situation, queen and knight against two rooks. A queen is worth about 9 pawns. A knight is worth about 3 pawns. That's 12. A rook is worth 5. The two rooks are worth about 10 pawns. White is up material here. 12 to 10 if we're thinking about it numerically. You may see that I can play the move rook f7 here. But this would be a big mistake because white can simplify. Queen takes f7 check. King takes f7. King takes e1. Two rooks for the queen are gone. White's left with a knight winning the game. I can't do that. The skewer doesn't work. You see what my plan was here? The key is for me to check him away from my rook, and then to go after that knight by removing the defender. I played rook check, and he played king g3. If he goes back to g1, what should I do now? Here I have the very strong move, rook f7. You see his king is trapped in the back rank. After rook f7, his queen has to move. And now, what do I do? Of course. Rook e1, checkmate. So his king has to come up. King to g3. If he plays king f3, I can just check him again. If he goes back to f2, I check him again. Now, he's up material. I'm trying to save this game. Remember, I was in huge trouble. If he goes back and forth, back and forth, it's perpetual check. That's a draw, that's fine. If he plays king f3, rook e3 check, and then king f4, what do we do now? Now we can bring a rook to the e4 square, checking him. And that square is defended by my pawn. Now let's go back. He played king g3, and now I checked him again. Rook 2 to e3 check. He played king h4. Now this was the critical position. We had both calculated to here a long time ago. When I played rook f6, I saw this position. Remember, when you're in trouble, when your opponent has calculated something out, he thinks he has a forced win, the stakes are very high in either direction. When your opponent is on the edge of winning, he's also on the edge of losing the win. It's a funny thing about chess. The tension builds and builds and builds, and there are all these abstract things that happen. But then when the moment of truth comes, when mo things move, from the abstract into the concrete, the game can swing in either direction very quickly. This is a perfect example. Right here, a slightly better calculation can win the day. What did I have in mind? Here I saw that if I played the move rook f7, there's no way for him to keep defending his knight on d7. He can defend his king. For example, if I check him with a move like rook 7 to e4 check, he doesn't have to keep on coming up into danger. He can play a move like g4, blocking the check, and his king is safe. If he plays queen g4, you see what I play? Look for a powerful skewer. Yes, rook e4 wins the game. After rook f7, his queen has nowhere to go. e4 and d3 are covered. E5 and E6 are covered. G6 is covered. If queen G4, we have rook E4. H3 is covered. He has to throw out his knight. Knight F6. You see, I've trapped his queen in the middle of the board. This was the key thing to find when I saw that I could play rook F6. After knight F6 check, I played rook takes F6. He has to give up material to open up some space for his queen. He plays queen down 
to c8 check, king f7, queen takes c7 check, and here we agreed to a draw. If I was playing this game now, I wouldn't have agreed to a draw. I would have kept on fighting, pushing for a win. I like two rooks, but to be honest with you, when I was a kid, I didn't quite realize how strong two rooks are. Two rooks are a little bit better than a queen, but it's hard to coordinate them sometimes, and when I was younger, I was much more comfortable with the power of a queen than the power of two rooks, and in this game, I was just nine years old. So we agreed to a draw on this unclear position where black has slight advantage. Again, objectively, that probably wasn't the best decision for me. So once again, if we compare this game to the last one against Jeff Sauer, we see the importance of a save, calculating deeply, looking one step further than the opponent, having a clear head when under pressure. And that can be contrasted, of course, to my first game I showed you against David Arnett, where he threw me a curveball, I got into trouble, and then I fell apart. Over and over in your chess experience, you're going to find yourself in trouble. You have to keep a clear head. Think calmly. When the pressure is on, when he's attacking you, when he's on the edge of winning, that's the moment when you have to think most deeply, with the clearest head possible, and find the right move. Here, I had to find the quiet move, rook f7, the quiet move in the middle of the calculation, in order to play the move rook f6, or to be more honest, to decide that I was going to play rook f6 a few moves before that even. So, you have got to sometimes look for the quiet move, when your opponent is all excited, his heart is pounding too when he thinks he's about to win. It's the change of pace in calculation, which can often expose a hidden wrinkle in the position which catches your opponent off guard. Let's take a look at the next games.